Okay, thanks. Uh, next up is uh, Andrea Panayotu. Uh, by the way, uh, in the conference program that is under the entrance, there are uh, more uh, uh, extended uh, bios of each of our presenters. I'm just mentioning a couple of things just to move things along. Uh, Andreas is teaching social science, communications, and cultural studies at the Frederick University in Cyprus. Uh, he has worked and written on social history and the process of identity formation uh, in the experience of Cypriot modernity. And he's been searching much more. Like I said, you can already read it in the program. And the title of his presentation now is The Unavoidable but Sensual Wisdom of the Experience. Andrea. Uh, yeah. okay. uh, hello. Uh, okay, well, I will try to be more optimistic. <laughs> Let me start with the title, what I mean generally, and then I will move on uh, as it is written. Uh, I will talk about time and space. So the border experience refers to the geographical space that we really have, which is material. It's there, Cyprus is a geographical place which exists in the Eastern Mediterranean. Wisdom if we have to trace it in the way I mean it, actually refer to something like Lucas' historical consciousness. In other words, whether a people or a class can realize their real interest at the historical moment. Now, why is that sensor? It's an open question. In other words, one of the things we have to explore is what is happening in a place where the a real experience is censored, and there is a system by which, in some way or another, a colonized discourse, let's call it that, imposes itself, but never manages to win. The optimistic part of my argument, historically and empirically now, is that in some way the repress always returns, and in many ways, um, there is a way in which resistance is created and is built up, even if the dominant discourse tries to censor it. So it's unavoidable that the resistance will somehow not only emerge, but somehow, I would actually venture to say, will win, as a matter of fact. I have the impression that what we are really confronted with are details of the past inhibiting historical development, but that may appear too optimistic, so let me move on. Okay, so I will start with the everyday experience. And the everyday is closer to space. Okay? The hegemonic media image is closer to the colonizing uh, discourse. In 203, the borders, so-called borders, whatever, open between north and south side. It was a major moment of rebellion of the people against the media. Now, you have to understand that the media in Cyprus, if you are not Cypriot, are a very interesting phenomenon. I have to cut into the story here. Now, now we have a president who has been refusing to sign an agreement with the Trump. He actually said, I will even go into the streets to demonstrate with the working class if they try to cut things. Okay. The media, 90% of them, accuse him, attack him. Actually, when the archbishop said the same thing for the bank, that if the Troika does something to the bank, nobody said anything. Mm -hmm. But when the president said, he's a communist, he's a leftist. So when the president said it, they attacked him. You, I wrote it and I insist, we have lived three epic days in Cyprus during this week. I think from Sunday until uh, Wednesday, we had a blackmail by the economic elite threatening to kind of move money out of the popular bank and create something like an economic coup in order to impose more or less what they wanted. The media supported that. They created panic. Was there any particular reason why we should have agreed with the Troika now if the Troika hasn't even agreed with Greece in September? No. But anyway, so the media are a very interesting phenomenon. Back to 203. The media tried to tell the Greek Cypriots, don't go to the north. They went, they went, and they went, and so the media eventually gave up trying to censor that experience. What happened, really? If we follow the reports from the media of the people who were going, and I, if I base it also on biographical experience, we had suddenly um, something very interesting, the shrinking of distance 
even though Cyprus is very small island, it's a rock in the Mediterranean, literally. And actually, in the 70s, even though technology had been shrinking, means that even more, in Cyprus, distance has been expanding. <laughs> Suddenly, going to northern Nicosia, for example, implied going over the whole eastern Mediterranean, you have to work in Athens, you have to work in Istanbul, from Istanbul you have to come to the north, etc. Suddenly in 203, the airport distance suddenly became again space as we know. There was something else also. The Greek Cypriots went to the north to find their past, the image they had of what they lost, their paradise lost in some way or another. The Greek Cypriots came to the south to find their future. They thought Cyprus is entering Europe, wow, you know, it So these people actually were moving in the same space but in different times in many ways. So it was a rebellion, but a rebellion constructed with discourses borrowed from the hegemonic discourse. So it didn't last much. A year later when we had the referendum, the media imposed their will. They said no. Remember, there the media fought tooth and nail for no to unification. Now, the, I don't know if there is any other country in the world in which the media are fighting tooth and nail against the government trying to force it to sign an agreement with the Troika. Chile, again, in 1973, is an only comparable example. Hopefully they don't have plans this time. Okay. Now, let me go to a little bit historical and zero time I have also. Okay, now, how do we come to this situation? If we go back to the 18th century, we have a major historical text of Cyprus. It's called the Chronological History of Cyprus. Very interesting text. It's very interesting because Cyprus is still considered a space. In other words, it's not considered in historical linear continuities. It's conceived in the sense of everybody who comes into this island belongs to Cyprus. It's like, like Noel's sheep or something like that. There is no identity in terms of nations. Space is dominant, therefore, even though some linearity emerges. But the ancestry of Cypriots is traced to Noah, actually, to a you know, grandson of Noah called Ketim. Everybody forgot it now. But that was the dominant idea until then. The geographical experience of Cypriots back then was definitely Eastern. In other words, it revolved into Istanbul, Jerusalem, Beirut, and Alexandria. That was the work. Cyprus was situated into its own space. 200 years later, as Cyprus was integrated into the capitalist economy created by Europe, initially in the outer space, then in the periphery, and eventually integrated hook as well as Texas, everything changed. A different kind of space emerged in which Cypriots actually didn't exist. We have natives which were non-existent. The Cypriots suddenly were considered Greek or Turks. Religious identities receded or were excluded from the school curriculum. The school curriculum came from the outside, Greece and Ottoman Empire, Turkey. And they re educated the people that actually they were ancestors uh, descended from ancient Greeks or some Turks who were coming from Asia or something like that. What was happening? It was a major split between the spatial experience and the temporal experience. Temporal experience became colonial. In other words, what was happening in the schools was a profound effort at modernizing Cypriots and changing and reshaping their identity. Now, this thing started creating a series of paradoxes. I refer to one, you'll probably pick it up, but I will come to more obvious things. To understand how this concept of colonizing space by a temporal ideology uh, managed to create a split and eventually a conflict. A resistance will reside in space. Let me refer to a few examples. For example, uh, even the nationalists have to phrase their discourse in terms of space, even though they hated space. When I mean they hated space, Cyprus was almost non-existent. In, if we take it in terms of maps, they had this map of Greece, and then they had a small box next to it, and they put it there. Typical, in other words, space is eliminated. We want to make it big, and we make it big. Okay? And if geography doesn't fit us, we change geography. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Now they're taxing something on others. You understand? Right? They decided to put it on the island. Take one part and leave. If we cannot take one part and leave, we will somehow conceive of it like this. I mean, see, this is modern colonialism becoming imperialism into everyday. Now, everyday is however resistant. So they have to conceive their ideas in terms of space. Cutting space, uniting space, doing something with space, but they couldn't really get into it. We come to 1945. World War II is over, we enter the age of decolonization. The, the, the idea of enosis with Greece uniting, with, annexing the island to Greece may have been slightly logical, slightly, slightly logical, because Greece was an authoritarian regime anyway. Who in the hell would want to annex themselves to them? <laughs> they decided that they wanted to annex the island, they checked this island, it diffused the discourse into everyday life through the schools, etc. So we come, 1945. Everybody is fighting for independence. We are fighting for enosis. Why are we fighting for enosis? Well, there are already, you know, ideas in everyday from the 1920s. Secret of modernism is spatial. It emphasizes strongly the idea of there's an island, we live in this place, etc., etc. By 1948, we come to a climactic moment. The schools, which are the primary vehicles, also in these papers, through which these new colonial discourses, and I call national discourses colonial, you, you are not getting it wrong, you can assume it. They were colonial, they were trying to annex the island, they were trying to eliminate the natives from existing. They wanted to make them Greeks and Turks, not Cypriot. Cypriot was a world which existed. <laughs> it existed because there was an island called Cyprus, but the dominant discourses talked about that. Now, keep in mind that we have paradox. Until then, even though we had two rival religions, Christianity and Islam, living in Cyprus, as a matter of fact, the two communities, ignorant, they didn't even know how to read and write. But somehow, mysteriously, as long as they were, they managed to discover that, well, let's figure it out. If the Imam says that Virgin Mary is a virgin, and he respects her, and we Christians like her because supposedly she's the mother of God, Maybe we can coexist. So they coexist. Hey, you know, I mean, this is supposed to be high class, secular, academic discovery. The peasant of Cyprus discovered it way earlier. For four centuries they knew it. We even had a community, as a matter of fact, in Bambagi, who assumed that, you know, Jesus and Mohammed were both nice guys and they went to both things. And actually, this community who was the leader of a rebellion. Now, this idea had to be eliminated. We had to become descendants of Tevkros, a significant guy, like Noah, okay? and some guy coming from the East, so it became Greeks and Tev. And suddenly, as we were modernizing under the colonial discourse, we started fighting with each other. <laughs> Why in other words, Mohammed and Jesus, for mysterious reasons of the peasants, because I'm um, saying it in an ironic way, because theoretically speaking, who are ignorant peasants in the West were supposed to educate us, right? So when they were educated, us, we started killing each other. <laughs> <laughs> they are getting worse. No, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. By 1948, there is a major conflict. Who were the people actually who figured out that? Well, this island is a valuable plot of land. The lower classes, the lower classes which coalesce to the left, the communist left, or whatever you want to call it, were the ones actually from 1948 who were saying, "Wait a minute." Something is changing around us. The Arabs are getting decolonized. Maybe we should see reality geopolitically. No, the church was expecting the second coming. The second coming was Emerson Winter. So at some point, in that complicated, conflictual situation of 48, 48, 47, 48, the British suggested, out of the blue, but I mean, it wasn't anything conspiratorial. They said, well, why do you introduce your books only from Greece? Why don't you write some of them here? Not the major textbook. We write some textbooks, you know. Nothing will happen. You will not buy them. The church issued the ultimatum. And the people, not the people, the people of the church, support it. Right? Every book written by a Cypriot is definitely worse than the books written in Greece. I mean, how, how worse can it get in terms of slavery? I mean, you're saying that, no, we don't want our books. Mind you, these are the same people. 17 years later, who will be fighting with Greece to claim autonomy in school. 
slavery of the mind. <laughs> they were nice people. I'm not saying where they were. But once you get colonized in the mind, you become like that. Language. The secret of the stubborn like the donkeys. Okay. They tried for a whole century to eliminate the Cypriot. I will call it language, but not for them. Greek nationalists in the audience, if there are any of them. I will call it Greek, the uh, Cypriot linguistic version. <laughs> yeah, now you have to give them the same side of the right? Now, so they try to eliminate it. It's barbarian. Horkan, village. No, we want good Greek. Yes. We understand it. That means that. Interesting. Why would we adopt the language we don't understand? I mean, you go to church and you hear a language ancient Greek you don't understand, but it's okay. You don't go to church to understand. You go to there to obey, right? You obey your God. But why would you go to school, theoretically modern school, and learn a language which is there, or a language you don't understand? Obedience. Now, what is, how do we adopt this temporal, colonial discourses of the mind? We adopted them in many ways because there's a local elite which has every interest in playing the mediator between the local and the West. Only we are the ones who speak good Greek. You are barbarian, so we should speak. On the Cypriot television until 1990, you couldn't hear Cypriot. The Cypriots kept talking about it. But somehow they accepted it. Now, this created, to show the resistance part, a very interesting phenomenon. Cypriots had to translate. And if once they heard the Greek version, they had to translate in their own dialect, language version, what it meant. And when they were to speak, again, they had to translate. So this created this minute gap of, I don't really believe that. Even Magaios would like to do that. He spoke in this arcane language. So everybody knew that. He was actually saying something which wasn't really the truth. He was trying to say something else. So we learn to interpret our politicians. They're lying here. Okay? That's why they hate Christopher, the current president. He speaks simply with one, and secondly, probably he's not lying. That's the worst one. Okay? So here we come. It gets, it gets, it gets even worse. 1991, to make a long story short, there is a huge debate. Can't somebody say on television that he's a Cypriot? No, you cannot say Cypriot. They ban the problem. <laughs> yeah. It depends on that. It's a rich country, for God's sake. Now, would you ask the Cypriots, for example, to give any part of their sovereignty to anybody? No, they will fight to the name. So where are they Mazotis? They are not Mazotis. There is a colonial discourse which permeates here, which imposes certain limits. Now, this resistance was built, let me see where I am. <laughs> okay, how much am I? A five minutes? Um, okay. Now, uh, this resistance was built on the unaccounted category of space. Do we have any proof of it? Yeah, from the 1920s, we have a very interesting phenomenon. Small communist party in Memphis, big thing. Some intellectuals around the world probably, you know, they hear about the Russian Revolution and they create a communist party. party. It became massive. We started getting 10 to 15 percent in local village elections. If the church was so powerful, how the hell did uh, these athletes manage to get 10 to 20 percent? And then suddenly the vote is they became a massive woman. Something is wrong in the history we learn. Something doesn't work. So uh, the residual category here is class resistance. Class resistance existed from the Ottoman times. It was by communal as a matter of fact. The bonds between the two communities were much stronger than the community between Cypriot and Greek or Turk. Now, this is not a view. This is what we call material and empirical reality scientifically. Everybody can check it out. How many class rebellions we had in the last three centuries? How many by communal conflicts we had before 1945? None and many. Class many, ethnic none, or very few minor incidents here and there, etc. Totally sensible. Then we enter the 50s. The 50s eventually the right wing decides that it will come from you know God and will reside on earth. Now you have to understand the right wing is a very interesting phenomenon here. The right wing believed that they wanted the British to behave as good 
fathers or mothers and give cycles to an imaginary mother. I don't have time. But think of this Oedipus complex that is leading to here. You have a country which wants another country to be its mother. Why on earth would you want a mother? And you have a mother at home. Who wants to make, transform these people into children? Why? Right. Why are we being transformed into boisterous or son? So, we have the 1950s, the left mobilizing, the right wing decides to fight also. Margarius comes along, charismatic, promising, at the same time ambitious young man. Cyprus becomes independent, very convenient. The massive movement was of the left. The right wing in the last minute, remember, hello, we are anti-colonial also. So they get the power. Who they would they really give the power to? They would give it to the communists? No, they would give it to the right. How could we? Okay, they get the power. And immediately they have to confront another problem. They have to legitimize their power in terms of embassy. Because these poor kids, they were, were killed in the anti-colonial struggle, were living in But they created an independent state. The independent state is filled with people from the right. In this conjuncture, Greece behaves as a typical country which wants hegemony, right? I mean, come on, folks, you are villages, remember? Move to Bahia. I mean, the military government of 67 and 74 was not, was simply the extreme. All the democratic so-called governments of Greece before, they did the same thing. There is this great democratic leader of Greece, George Pavandreou, father of Andrea Pavandreou, who said once famously, what are the Americans asking us? They are asking us to give us a high story building polydactyl. And they are asking simply for a small room on the top, because the Americans suggested from 64 a plan for partitioning the island. As if the building is there. Huh. The civil right wing would never accept that. They were Greeks, they were Union, blah, 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 everywhere. But one thing they would never accept is lose to their own state. So they fought. Cypriot consciousness started emerging in the 60s. It's one of the very interesting phenomena of uh, Cypriot history that we have this massive movement supporting independence which lacks words. You can't say really you are Cypriot. You can't say you like independence. We have to find a new formula. We belong to Greece, but we have an independence. And the very same people who in 48 said, don't dare write a book by a Cypriot. No, they like the books by Cypriot. Actually, it's not that bad. After all, you know, the British have some good things, etc. you know. Adjustment. Cypriot consciousness eventually will become victorious in the 70s. Not only because of resistance. Resistance created it. But the 70s became victorious and was adopted by everybody because it represented the material interest of the islanders. It's in their own interest to have an independent state. Of course, they managed to lose half of it in the process, but it's okay. At least they had the sovereignty of the other one. Now, we have, therefore, uh, a new reality here. We are still in this imaginary fixing of the West. The Troika has come. The Troika will come on the 12th of November. God, what if we don't have a memorandum by then? That's the idea. Crisis. The 12 passes, nothing happens. They are in huge crisis. They wait for a week and they start again. This president doesn't sign. We have to do something. Blackmail. We will sink one of the banks. Economic coup. No newspaper rights. They simply say, uh, the banking sector was on the verge of collapse. Why the hell was the banking sector on the hell of collapse? This banking sector is on the hell of collapse since last spring. As a matter of fact, this banking sector is on the verge of collapse since last year, by the way. Since last year, when an explosion in a military camp was acute on the president instead of the military. That was a very convenient thing the media did again, right? Exactly at the moment that the Greek that issue was emerging and that the Cypriot banks who played in Greece lost the money, we accuse the president, right? <laughs> the guy who says the banks are responsible, let's accuse him. What we have is a media attack on democracy in Cyprus. I don't think it's it. I think we'll get over this thing one way or another. But we have to see also that the roadblocks are not only in the street. When I revisited in my, to, uh, last summer, North Cyprus, actually I found a very good image. Cyprus is being reunified in terms of space. When I visited, I also felt there was a past and a future. 
Now we are almost on an equal level. We go and we come and we are closer to that reality. The media refuse, of course, to accept it. We will resist in many ways. Actually, when the president told them on Wednesday in the meeting of the prohibition that, look, what they are asking us, what they were asking us, was to take 7 billion of social security and just write it off so that the money we give to the banks will not be added to the public debt. They were asking from social security to pay for the banks. But at least two of the other politicians figured out that, hey, something is wrong, okay? So, we are, I insist, in a situation in which space or our material interests are still censored, but in some way or another, like the press in their conscience, keeps returning and makes people kick. And this resistance, one way or another, whether it's the realization that Cyprus is an island and we cannot split it, we cannot take it, we cannot build the wall, etc. It's just an island, and Nicosia and Famagusta are just neighborhoods in New York. You know, I mean, there are small little villages in global terms. The media will realize it, the hegemonic discourse will realize it. But we don't have to fight abstract ideas, we have to fight powerful forces in our society who use the West in order to impose their will. So we we'll fight. Interesting and enjoyable. Uh, Pressure, please. Yes, Nadia, yes. And you can use the microphone there, so everybody can hear you. Can I just There must be one couple of seats next to each other. I really enjoyed your talk, Andreas, but uh, what I wanted to say is that this clash between the two communities, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, is not only propagated, let's say, by the church and the upper uh, classes, because uh, this feeling, there was a feeling that pre-existed, even uh, it can be uh, traced in medieval times, whether it be chronicle or recounting the history of the island by Leontios Maicheras. Uh, he, he refers, of course, he, he belonged to the Cypriot Greek upper classes of the time, and he referred to the Turks as uh, the dogs. In the same way, he referred to the Genoese also as the dogs. And also Leontius Macheras is not is not the problem of today that we consider Cypriot Greek as the barbarous variety of the Greek language. It existed then. I mean it's a fa very famous um, uh, mention of Macheras, que barbaris and Omega, and the Greek became barbarous, the Greek of the for, uh, late 14th and early 15th uh, century, uh, because of this uh, cut off from the main Byzantine corpus and the Byzantine literature of the time. So the same ideas that pre-existed, so it's not only the product of this church uh, struggle to impose this ideology, um, at the time, at medieval uh, times, everybody who invaded Cyprus, be it uh, Turks or Genoese or Venetians, were considered uh, in the beginning as uh, uh, enemies. And then, of course, came the coexistence, came the, uh, the living, a peaceful uh, uh, cohabitation, and uh, the Cypriot dialect, uh, which was formed at the time, we have the beginning of the Cypriot dialect, uh, became the lingua franca, that is the, the, the language that was uniting all the ethnic uh, elements of a multi-national uh, and multilingual uh, society. And even we have a document by a traveler of the time that even the Frankish uh, rulers, the, the kings, uh, spoke of French uh, only um, so, um, as symbol in the, in the dialect of the time, the French of the time, and they communicated between them in uh, the Cypriot dialect. And uh, I wouldn't think that the Cypriot dialect uh, is a different language from the Greek uh, corpus. 
the, the dialect is, uh, the Cypriot dialect is a dialect uh, belonging to the south or eastern uh, group of dialects in which uh, also belong the Dodeganese and Theos, the same rules and the same, it, it, it mainly differs from the mainland uh, Greek in, um, in terms of phonology, it's only that. And the only morphological difference is the, uh, I would think is the uh, following of the personal pronoun in the recipe of Greek, the following, uh, like, uh, uh, Areskimu. Let's not get into two. Yes. We'll think it's the not receiving. So I, I wouldn't think that makes it. Uh, what I want to say, you say, and don't is that this doesn't make it a different language. Yeah. yeah. If, uh, yes. I mean, you, you this is what I want to say. That's why I'm mentioning this. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but you said a lot, so let, let him respond. Yes, I think it's going to uh, I can think so. Points. But anyway, you are uh, somewhat fascinating to me. <laughs> but I think uh, I, I, I find the same things happening even uh, in the 14th or 15th century Cyprus. So let's uh, not talk only about the church intervention and the uh, uh, ruling classes intervention to do that. I think it's uh, something more than that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nadia. One, I have to clarify. I never want to imply that this is the church who did it. On the contrary, what I was trying to say is that there is a group, like an elite, a structural group. Part of it is the church. I, I simply use the church symbolically in terms of who express the right. I meant also a group of the teachers, a large part of the upper sector of the media, in other words, those who coordinate the media today, people who have an interest as Peter Loiso said, to defend certain aspects of which come from a different culture versus the local. In other words, if the fight is between high class, in high culture, language, or whatever, versus everydayness, there are certain local groups which benefit from that. So uh, that's there. Some, as a matter of fact, some uh, part of the church were resisting. As a matter of fact, the, rock, the current activism, despite of his funny ideas, He's a Spanish Cypriot, as a matter of fact. I mean, so there is uh, the church was simply part of the structure. The church benefited by delaying modernization. It used the outside to say more or less that, hey, we are your father and mother, and if you don't accept us, we will invent a mother for you. But I would remind you that the church resisted the nationalism until 1910. The big fight in the church in, at the beginning of the century had a lot to do with the Romaic versus the Greek Hellenic. And it was a compromise. So it's a structural group, not only the church. As a matter of fact, if you look at the actual shows, the majority of them in the 20th century didn't want union with Greece. <laughs> Even that is indicative. When they were honest with it. Now, the reference you had, uh, Nadia, you don't know here, she's an expert on your Mahera, so we have to accept her work for many things, but you are, right, in the historical context. In other words, what was happening, the Turks were still outside. Leontius Mahera, when he refers to both of them as dogs, he's voicing a typical, what I was trying to say here, spatial identity, we versus them. He was obviously clear with the Christians. Which Christians, however? The Romaic, okay? The Romaic is not the Greek. I think it's, we should clarify both the terms. The Romaic has to do with the Orthodox version of Christianity and identity, whose center is currently Istanbul, Constantinople. It's not Athens. Romaic has nothing to do with death cross. Romaic has to do with Latin. The, the story I was telling you. Romaic versus Latin. Right, but it's still, it, it still refers to the Orthodox version. So uh, the Turks were not like, but when the Turks took over the island, as a matter of fact, they were welcomed by the Orthodox. They benefited the Orthodox, even though the Church forgets this part. And the majority of the Greek Turkish Cypriots, Muslims, whatever, they were actually part of the local population, Latins or uh, Orthodox, who transformed. So the coexistence of both communities for three centuries was also part of the fact that Islam and Christianity coexisted. They were not at war like at the time of Leonidas Mahera. Now, in terms of language, uh, okay, we, we disagree. In other words, if you take forbidden word, Macedonia, you know, the thing they call Thiron. Thiron has a language, they speak a language, you know. Now, these people have a so-called language. 
which the Bulgarian speak, it's a so-called language, it's a dialect. It's recognized. Now, okay, we, we can argue linguistic a little, but I'm a sociologist, okay? Peter Reyes said it perfectly, in my opinion. What is the difference between a language and a dialect? A language has a school system at its control and an army to impose it. <laughs> okay. In other words, what we have, I can elaborate, you can correct me if I'm wrong with this, but the first, even if we, of course, the Cypriot linguistic version belongs to what we call Greek originated Elinogenes languages, like we have Slavic languages, Latin languages, etc. Still, if uh, Menelaus Christogur is not wrong, and I assume he's not, this is the first linguistic version of Greek origin which has been written down. It has been written down during the Middle Ages. Question. If it has been written down during the Middle Ages, why did we make the language? Why did we have to import something from Greece? Why would the Slavs manage to have so many languages, the Latin so many languages, and here we have to have only one language centered on the University of Athens? It's a political decision, in my opinion. It's a political decision whose repercussions are deeply cultural. It puts one population, if we were a colony, it would be different, but we are not. So it puts one population at a disadvantaged position vis-a-vis the other. But it's a question of debate from there. Uh, just to, uh, a very yeah. brief comment, um, for me, linguistically wise, to have a different language, you have to have a different syntax and a different morphology. No, yeah, we can and, get into linguistics. This does we not, does not exist. This no, does not they exist. don't put it censor. We put it right. Nadia, no, 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 you can continue later on the discussion. Okay, yes. We just wanted to no, for me to, but. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I yeah, uh, just I, I have to give it a bit of time. Full disagreement. Because we have a schedule. Uh, so uh, there were some more questions. I'm sorry, I'm not going to take them. We have to overboard with time. So, Andreas, thank you very much again. Okay, it was wonderful. Bye.